Good morning. <laughs> Let's do that one more time. Good morning. And for those of you who are joining us uh, online, uh, good morning to you wherever you are. I do know that there are some people from Australia who is tuning in to today. And uh, welcome again uh, to Bethany Evangelical Free Church. A few days ago, uh, I took leave for the first time together with my wife. Yes, your pastor does need a break from time to time. <laughs> and on Wednesday, we went to this uh, studio called uh, Studio Asobi. And uh, there was this couple, this is in Aogang area, and this couple had this uh, HDB flat where they teach people about pottery, but they are a Christian couple, and they use that... Um, session to help people understand more about God. And uh, this, this is the couple here, Kenneth and Hui Wen. And both of them, uh, in fact, Hui Wen was trained in Japan. Both of them had uh, very good careers, but some, somehow in about seven years ago, they decided to stop everything and went to Japan. First for snowboarding, and they decided to stay behind. Hoi Wen decided to stay behind to learn more about um, poetry and to consider a career change. They decided to live a life that is radically different from the pursuit of a typical Singaporean Christian. And I say that a typical Singaporean Christian. Purposely, because Singaporeans, we often chase after positions and power and prestige. And as Christians, we oftentimes want to do things for God without thinking true carefully whether it is for God or even for ourselves. And they were radically different. They were counter-cultural in many ways. And I learned a lot even through the sharing in the three hours that I was with them. One of the few things I learned about poetry is this, that there are different kinds of clay. Uh, in Singapore, we have uh, in Red Hill, for example, uh, a reddish kind of clay. And they were, uh, Kenneth was molding out a clay and it's totally red. This one that you see is from Australia. All right. So there are different kinds of clay. And for clay to become ceramic itself, you need to go under not only just drying process, a long drying process, about three days or so, but you also need to go through two firings, one at 900 degrees Celsius, and that is only to make it into a permanent, uh, you, you cannot turn it back anymore. Once you do that, you cannot change the properties back to a clay. But that is not just it. You need to fire it again, and color it first, but glaze it first, then fire it again to 1,200 degrees Celsius for it to become porcelain, the one that we have, uh, we use for our utensils. So, in many ways, our Christian faith, our life, our journey with God has to go through a lot of fiery trials in order for us to become useful for God. And as we go through this series in 1 Peter, allow me to again remind us that the people, the churches in Asia Minor whom Peter is writing to, they are going through tremendous fiery trials. We know that they were already counter-cultural in their behaviours, and I'll talk more about that later on. In their acts of worship, is very radically different from what the Greco-Roman world uh, practiced in those days. But more than anything else, in fact, if you read in chapter 4, verse 12, the fiery trials were literally named. It says, Peter says to them, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So therefore, these people were going through tremendous trials. And if I were to recap for you over the last three weeks or so, we've heard uh, various sermons. I began this series by sharing with you why we should be countercultural Christians in a very changing and challenging time. And of course, 
Pastor Paul Lau, thankfully, he has decided to join us and he'll hopefully come on board in August. Pastor uh, Paul Lau has reminded us that instead of being a tiny red dot Singapore, we are tiny holy dots. And we can exercise our faith even in the midst of these fiery trials. And then, of course, last week, Pastor Kenny reminded us of who we are. In fact, if you look at uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we realize that Paul, sorry, Peter is reminding the early Christians that they are royal priesthood, a holy nation. And they are born again Christians who will be used by God in a world that goes against their faith. So to expect trials and fiery trials is not unusual for us. And as we come to today's sermon, today's passage in chapter 2, verses 11 to 17, we are beginning um, a series of the, the practical how-tos and what of our faith. Meaning to say, as counter-cultural Christians, what should we do or behave, especially to governments? Today I'll be talking about that. And next week, we will have another speaker, Pastor uh, Liao Wenping. You have heard him online, but he'll come on board um, next week. And he'll be talking about the relationships between masters and servants, husbands and wives especially when you face difficult governments, difficult masters, difficult bosses, difficult spouses, what should we do in order to be counter-cultural Christians? And the question I have for us all today is this, what should Christians do to glorify God? Let me say that one more time. What should you and I do in order to bring glory to God? And corollary to that question, a secondary question that I would like to ask is, if we do those things, what do these behaviors accomplish? When we do those things that are countercultural, what happens? What does it do? What accomplishes as a result of those things. And this is where we turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 17. I won't read that for you because Penneth has already read it for us. But I'd like to present to you three things, three behaviors. And we'll talk about behavior very shortly. Three behaviors that Christians should do and perform in order for the world to know that we are Christ followers. Three things. The first is we don't sin, but we do good to glorify God. And that's found in verses 11 to 12. Secondly, we submit to authorities to fulfill God's will and silence gossipers. Yes, in those days, they gossip too. All right, and that's found in verses 13 to 15. And finally, honour and love everyone to serve God in verses 16 to 17. All right, don't sin, submit to authorities and love and honour everyone. So what should Christians do to glorify God? And a secondary question is, what do these behaviours accomplish? The very first thing that we read in Second, uh, First Peter, Second, Chapter Two, verses eleven to twelve is this. Let me read for you verses eleven to twelve. It says, "Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul." Verse twelve. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So the very first thing as counter Christians is that we don't sin, but we do good in order to glorify God. Sinful behaviour not just by Peter, but also Paul and everyone 
of us know this. It's written in scripture. In fact, all religion tells you that sinful behavior wage war against not just our flesh, but our very soul. It creates an uneasy conscience. Yes, we can be jaded, we can be callous, we can be hardened by sin. But sin ultimately wages war against our soul. And But before he even tells us that, in fact, he has already developed that in the first two chapters earlier in this passage, and he'll continue to say so later on in chapter 3. But he begins this portion, this what to do, by reminding them again, just as he has reminded them in chapter 1, that they are sojourners and exiles in this world. This, in fact, is a literal uh, copy of what we call the Septuagint. In Genesis, there is a man called Abraham. And Abraham was called from the place called Ur, of the Chaldeans towards the promised land. And he was in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And the Septuagint says that he, he and his family were sojourners and they were exiles to a foreign land. So when Peter says that, I think he had Abraham in mind as well to remind his people that this world is ultimately not our home. And as we gather all the resources, as we build our castles and our condominiums, maybe not castles here, but condominiums and our houses, our cars, and all the seas that you can possibly think of, remember this, that we are sojourners and exiles in this dry and weary land. And he reinforces that idea that this impermanence of this place that we live in is when we, towards the end, is there's one day, someday that we'll be giving an account for. And that's found in verse 12. It says here that God will be glorified on the day of visitation. God is going to visit us one day, someday. We know that because Jesus promised that he'll come back, right? He came 2,000 years ago, and he'll come back one more day, one day, someday. And that will no longer be a time when people can still get a second chance. There's no more second chance then. And he will judge both the living and the dead. And so therefore, when we live in this world, we need to remember that we cannot continue to sin without consequences. And if you want to be a countercultural Christian, when you want to really demonstrate the beauty of the cross, when you want to live your life as a Christian, you need to remember this, that sinful behaviors will wage war against our soul. We do not sin as Christians, and we do good. Why do we do that? Because doing that will glorify God. In fact, Peter was so concerned about godly behavior that he mentions this many times throughout this letter, this very short letter here. The word behavior or conduct is mentioned six times in just this letter, and two more times in Second Peter. These are the ones, in fact, the, the Greek word here is uh, anastrophe. Right? Anastrophe itself is repeated six times in First Peter, and First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 already tells us that we are to be holy in all our conduct. Verse 18 of chapter 1 says that we are ransomed from the futile ways or futile conducts of our past. And, of course, this passage today in verse 12 of chapter 2 tells us that we are to keep our conduct amongst the Gentiles, among those who do not believe in, in God, honourable. And then chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, again, he says that the reason why we do that godly conduct is because by doing so, our spouses, our masters will be won over. And of course, 
we do so because they can see. Those are the visible things that they can see. In order for, for, for them to see God, they have to see the conduct, the behaviours that you and I do. And of course, ultimately in chapter 3, verse 6, he says, those who revile you, those who, who make your life miserable, but because of your good conduct in Christ, they will be put to shame one day. On that day of visitation especially. You may not win all the battles of life, but you and I will win the war in life when he comes back on the day of visitation. So therefore, you and I, as countercultural Christians, what behaviours must we do? Many a times I hear this, you say, it's okay, you know, pastor, it's, um, I, I, I believe in God in my heart will do. I think that is only halfway, half-baked. That the clay that was fired at once at 800 degrees Celsius or 900 degrees Celsius, that will not make it into ceramic or porcelain. Water can still seep through that. It's still useless as an instrument or as a utensil. You need to be fired thoroughly. And so therefore, when you say that I only believe in God inside me and I only, uh, in my personal, private space, I'm godly, it's nonsense. You need to demonstrate outwardly this faith that you believe in. Our outward behavior is a mirror to our inward beliefs. And the reason why we say those things is because we do not know who God is or what Scripture tells us. When we do not exercise our faith, we are like not salt and light to a dark and tasteless world. We are like warehouses where we keep all the salt together. Which is why I'm so glad to let you know that God is opening doors for us to partner with our community. And in fact, like, like I said before, we're punching above our weight. God is allowing us many opportunities that are unheard of to go to a nearby school. A school to open, the school has opened the doors for us to partner with them in reading programs, in many activities. We need to exercise our faith. Our outward behavior is a mirror to our inward beliefs. So then, what should you and I do to glorify God? We learn from the earlier uh, verses 11 to 12 that we need to do what? We need to? Not sin and do good to glorify God. But is there anything else? And this is where Peter moves to verses 13 to 15. Verses 13 to 15, he reminds them that yes, outwardly we need to do those things, but we also need to do one more thing, and that is to submit to the authorities to fulfill God's will and to silence gossipers. The godly behavior that you and I should do is not only just don't sin and do good, but we also need to learn proper biblical submission. Biblical submission is hard. Admittedly, it's very, very hard. Even for me, uh, and I'm more impatient most of the time, and sometimes I can be quite critical as well. But yet, Peter reminds them that you are to submit to the authorities and by doing so, you fulfill God's will and put to shame gossipers. And this is what he says in verses 13 to 15. He says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether is it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And in another translation, you should put to silence those gossipers. My dear friends, God ordained governments 
and authorities over us, our bosses, our superiors, our Zenghu in Hokkien, in order for his will to be done. And authorities do that. Most authorities, most governments do that. They punish evildoers, as what Peter says, and they praise those who do good. Praise be to God. And by submitting to governments, we will be able to silence those people who speak evil against us, who call us names. Now, some of us may be thinking, what kind of gossips are they talking about the first century Christians, right? What, what were some of the labelings that they were given in those days? What are the ignorance of these foolish people in verse 15 that Peter is referring to? Well, they, the Christians in those days are called the CIA. What do I mean by that? Right? There were gossips about first century Christians, and this is not from any of the texts that you read here, but it was from, like, for example, Josephus, the historian. There were early Christian or early writers in the Greco Roman world who talks about this followers of this Christ, this Messiah. And they were called cannibals, they were called incestuous people, and they were called atheists. Of all things, they were atheists. Why? Why is that so? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why are they called cannibals? Next week, we will be having our Lord's Supper, right? And when I conduct the Lord's Supper, what do I do? This is my body broken for you. Take it in remembrance of me. This is cup of the new covenant, covenant made in my blood. Drink of it in remembrance of me. Imagine you as a neighbor of a group of Christians and you walk across their house and there's a window there and you see them say this, you hear them say, blood, flesh, broken. And then you see the cup is wine, but it looks red. And you're thinking, are they cannibals? Are they eating humans? And so therefore the gossip goes on like this, that they eat Humans, they're cannibals. Not only just that, they're called incestuous. Or they, they practice incest. Why is that so? Because they also hear each other, greet each other, brothers and sisters in Christ, and they kiss each other with a holy kiss. That's what Paul tells us, kiss each other with a holy kiss. And next thing you know, they got married, brothers and sisters got married, and next thing you know, you know, they have babies together and you're thinking, are these people <laughs> related in, by blood and yet doing all these terrible things? That's why they're called names. And of course, atheists, because why? They don't go to the temple to worship. They don't bow down to idols to worship God. They are gods. And they worship a God that cannot be made by hands. So there's no control. And so they were... Ignorant. Those first century people, when they see Christians, they say, these people are so different. They are countercultural and they are weird. And so this is the ignorance that Peter perhaps is referring to. But wait a minute. Some of you, I know at the back of your mind, say, what about those evil and those incompetent or bad governments? Should I submit to these authorities, these governments? And in passing, let me just say very quickly that there are few things that we need to really consider. The first thing is, verse 13 tells us, it's not for your own sake. You submit not because for your own self. You submit because for the Lord's sake. So that the gospel can continue on. And civil disobedience it's not unprecedented. That means it exists even in the Bible. Look at Acts, the book of Acts chapter... In fact, look at the entire book of Acts. There's a series of one after another of the apostles, Peter and, and, and Barnabas, and in fact, uh, Paul himself, going against the grain. The, the religious leaders, the, the high priests, forbid 
the Christians, Peter and the cohort in Jerusalem in Acts 4, to speak about this Messiah and they refused and they went on to praise God. And of course, we know the classic example would be the Israelites and Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt in protest against Pharaoh and Egypt. And of course, there are so many Old Testament prophets who went against ungodly kings and against the idolatry that they see. So it is possible to go against the authorities, but there's caveats, many caveats there. God and government are not equal masters. Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Jesus is king to us. Caesar is not. And then finally, obviously, this is not the time to develop this. This was not the intention of Peter. But I just want to be very clear to all of us, where we have at the back of our mind saying that, why should I submit to government? I don't even like them. Or I don't like this party. Or I don't like their faces. I don't like their policies. Remember this. Remember this. These are placed by God to punish evildoers and to praise those who do good. And you do so for the Lord's sake. But when any government tells you to do what is contrary to Scripture, we respectfully disobey. But we never use violence or worldly ways. Peter will talk about that in chapter 3, verse 9 onwards. We never do so. We never take on arms. Which is why it is of deep concern when this 16-year-old boy who was radicalized just this week, we found out. What he's doing is not according to Scripture. If he, if he were to read First Peter chapter 2 to 3, he will realize that this is not what God has commanded. And that begs the question, do we know Scripture well? Do we know how to interpret Scripture well? Which is why this coming Friday, 24 of you will be going for this hermeneutics class trained by Pastor Liao Wenping from BGST and you go through how to properly dissect and read scripture properly. So then, what should Christians do to glorify God? What do these behaviors accomplish? We come to the final part which is verses 16 and 17. And very quickly, he tells us to honour and to love everyone to serve God. Verses 16 and 17, let me read for you verses 16 and 17. He says here, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Verse 17, Honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the emperor. He's transiting now towards the next part, which is masters and servants. But in passing, he made a, like a summary statement here. This is like a hinge here to the next part of what to do in our community. First to the authorities, and he says this, that we are now, he reminds the first century Christians who have believed in Christ that you are now free. You are a royal priest who are a holy nation. You are not bounded by men's laws per se because God is pleased with you. But there are responsibilities still on this earth, this sinful earth. And he says that don't use that freedom for evil. That means you think that you're free and, and you're, you have a ticket to heaven and therefore you live your life according to what you want your way or the highway. He's not saying that. He said, in fact, you don't use those freedom in Christ to be misused. And he reminds them that we need to use that freedom as servants of God. In verse 16b, that is a powerful statement here. He is now putting them into what I call a Levitical posture or position. Remember, he already said your royal priesthood, a holy nation in verses 8 and 9 and 10 of chapter 2. 
Now he's saying that these people, these Christians, including Jews and Gentiles, they are servants of the Lord. That is a very high position. In the Old Testament, the servants of the Lord are only the prophets and ultimately the king himself. And now their, their status, their position is elevated to that height because they have direct access to God. But that freedom cannot be abused and misused. And so therefore, he summarizes it in verses 17 by telling them, in order for you to really exercise your freedom, do the following things. Honor everyone. Esteem everyone. Regard them as better than yourselves. Love the brotherhood, your fellow believers. Fear God. And there's a great lack today in our society to fear God and honour the emperor. If earlier he hasn't been crystal clear, he's now telling you, honour Caesar. And who's, he's writing this probably in prison. And who is this? Caesar is the one who will ultimately crucify Peter upside down one day. And yet, here's a man who tells them to honour and love everyone who serve God. That is countercultural. It's countercultural not to sin and do good. It's countercultural to submit to authorities even if you disagree with them. It's countercultural to honor and love everyone. Everyone. Especially those who hurt you or gossip about you or make your life miserable. But that, my dear friends, is when we are able to glorify God with our godly behaviors. Godly behavior brings glory to God. Now, back to my time with Asobi, Studio Asobi. There are many, many lessons as I reflected back that day. There are many, many lessons that I learned. But I just want to share with you some and I hope to bring some of the young adults together with me for this. In fact, they will be coming here and just to explore this place to see whether they could set up a studio here with us as well and offer us perhaps free lessons. A few lessons I learned. We all start with the same lump of clay. All of us are the same. We are sinful with a lot of impurities within us. But we will often end up being different creation under the hands of the porter. That, that this is me making my attempt to make, first it began as a cup, then it became a bowl, then it became a monstrosity, which I have no idea what it is. The only redeeming part is that I put the alpha and the omega there. <laughs> right? Now, different clays require different techniques to craft, and this is by hand, this is not a, uh, 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 troll clay where you, you do a spin wheel thing so you use this by hand and you know what it's okay to make mistakes and mess up sometimes I messed up big time <laughs> but when we do mess up we need a master right we need someone to redeem this was a lot of surgery done to it right it was cracking up but I was holes in it <laughs> So the, the master came and, and Kenneth and, and of course, uh, Hui, Wen. Hui Wen came and then patched up for me and made it look like something. <laughs> but the thing is, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. We are all lumps of clay. How useful we are, how beautiful we will be Depends on how much we submit and yield to God. The master porter. And we need to go through fiery trials. Just as the first century Christians went through tremendous fiery trials, even to the point of death. In order to refine us, to strengthen us, and may I even add, to beautify us. Remember, you need to be fired at 1,200 degrees Celsius 
for it to really become porcelain. And God is never over with us. And neither should we be with ourselves and with the people around us. And that's called grace. Let's exercise grace to ourselves and to other people as a way to show to the world that we are different. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you again for this reminder in 1 Peter chapter 2 that even though the first century Christians went through tremendous fiery trials, that yet through it all, that they persevered. And at the end of it, Lord, they lay a crown of righteousness waiting for them. And you have said to them, just as you say to us one day, we are all done, good and faithful servant. Father God, we look forward to that day that day when you will visit us so that, Lord, we will be able to present our brokenness to you and you can make us whole again. And until that day comes, O oh Lord, help us. Help us to lead, live godly lives and have godly behaviors so as to bring glory to you, O oh God. And in his precious name we pray, amen.